Good morning and welcome to Hope City Church Online. So good to be with you guys this morning. Once again, uh, just an absolute privilege just to be able to worship together and come into your homes this morning uh, as we lift up and magnify the name of Jesus. He is worthy of all praises and we exalt his name this morning. We welcome him, welcome in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in his presence there is revival, there is restoration and there is a renewing. So can we just come before him this morning, just with freshness before him this morning. As we lift up our worship to him, as we lift up his name this morning. May his presence just permeate every part of your home this morning. Father, we just give you praise this morning. We honor you because you are worthy of honor. You are holy. You are wonderful. You are magnificent. And we adore you, Lord God. We thank you. We thank you just that we have this incredible privilege to be able to worship together this morning. And so we want to exalt your name this, this morning, Lord God. We give you praise. We thank you because you are a good God. You are a good Father. Thank you for everything. That you do and so this morning we want to give you all in worship this morning we want to be able to just worship you with freedom and to come in spirit and in truth this morning to lift up the one and only name that is above every other name we exalt your name this morning lord we exalt your name give you praise lord jesus bless this time lord god as we Worship you. Amen.
Your love is like the wildest ocean Oh, and nothing else compares You are the Lord Almighty
Good morning and welcome to Hope City Church Online. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. My name is Glendon. I'm the lead pastor at Hope City Church. Normally, we'd be meeting at our facility in Eden Glen, Johannesburg, but because of the lockdown, like many other churches, we have gone digital. So a couple of announcements before we get into the sermon this morning. Our life groups meet on a Tuesday night and a Wednesday night. And they've been meeting via Zoom and via house party. And it's so important that we continue to meet together. We continue to encourage each other and connect. We continue to pray for each other and share all the things that God is doing in our lives. And so please continue to do that. I encourage you to join a life group if you haven't yet joined one. And uh, it's really good for us to do that. If you would like to give to what God is doing through Hope City Church, um, you can go to our website and find our banking details and you can EFT. Thank you to all those who have continued to give and tithe and be generous at this time. Um, it helps us to pay the rent for the building that we're not in <laughs> at the moment. And it helps us to, to care for those who are in need. So thank you to all those who have given. The Bible says that we should give with faith. We should give with a cheerful heart. We should give generously, not under compulsion, and we should give anonymously. So allow God to stir your heart and direct what you're giving. Besides life group and our regular Sunday services, we also have started a prayer meeting slash worship evening on a Thursday night, 7.30 p.m. Every Thursday, 7.30 p.m. on Facebook Live. We'd love you to join us as we pray for the church, as we pray for individuals, as we pray for the nation, as we pray for this pandemic and what God is doing through it. So I uh, hope to see you on Thursday night, 7.30 on Facebook, on our Facebook page. And then this coming Monday, the 4th of May, we're going to be starting something new. Because we can't meet together, we're going to be doing a, I think we're going to call it Monday night moment. We're going to create a moment where we can get deeper into God's Word, some training, some equipping, some discipling, some theology discussions, some foundations that we can get deeper in God's Word together. And so we'll be doing this via Zoom. So I will send out the link to the Zoom meeting on the church WhatsApp group. If you're not on that group, please get hold of me. I can forward that link to you also. It's going to be really good. Monday night, completely optional. You want to get deeper, you want to grow in your faith, then join us on Monday nights, um, this coming Monday, starting off. So we're going through the book of Colossians. We're in part eight of our way through this book. And this morning's title is called, The Struggle is Real. And I don't mean like when you got up on Friday morning and, and got to do some exercise for the first time in five weeks. I don't mean that kind of struggle. I mean, the struggle is real. I'm sure that all of us have struggled at some point to change some aspect of our life or our behavior or our speech or our thinking. It might be something outward, like you, you, you wanting to give up coffee. My brother, a few years back, decided to try and give up Coke. He was just drinking far too much Coke. But it may be a habit like smoking. It may be something internal like patience or your attitude, or just having perseverance through a difficult trial, termination. It may be a pattern of thinking about yourself, or how you speak, or how you view a certain person. It might be our attitude. We know that inherently none of us are perfect. We know this to be true. We know that we're all on some kind of journey of, of getting better and improving. But we also know that the struggle is real. It's hard to change ourselves. Confucius said, he who conquers himself is the mightiest warrior. And there's some truth in that. The fact that we can't control so many things and so many people all around us. That is true. But the one thing we can always do is work on ourselves and change ourselves. This week, my seven-year-old son, Ethan, had a bit of a meltdown. He hadn't listened to some of our instructions. Uh, he had hurt a sibling. He was angry. He was retaliating. Uh, he was blaming uh, all kinds of things and people for his own behavior. It was just a terrible situation. 
Eventually, I got him into his room and started the process of de-escalating his anger so that we could have a proper discussion about what had gone wrong. And around 15 minutes later, he suddenly broke down, started crying and weeping almost uncontrollably. And he was so distraught with the fact that uh, he wasn't able to do what he wanted to do. He ended up hurting his, his sibling. He ended up shouting and screaming and getting angry. And he knew he, he shouldn't do those things. But it seemed like he couldn't help himself. So he's upset with this fact. And he, he blurts out a few minutes later. He says, Dad, I hate sin. I hate sin. I wish it never come to the world. And at that moment, he'd come face to face with his own sin, with something about himself that he did not like, and that he was unable to change. And it really, really upset him to the point of tears. The Bible tells us that we all face a similar thing that my seven-year-old does, this lingering problem of sin and how we deal with it and how we change. And this is what Paul deals with in the next part of Colossians that we're going through. So turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to read from verse 5 to verse 17. Paul writes in verse 5, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Paul starts off, therefore put to death. The therefore means, in light of what he's just said a few verses earlier, which we spoke about last week, in light of that, verse 1 to 4, which talks about setting our hearts and our minds on the things above, where Christ is seated, knowing that one day we will be in glory with Him. In context of that, put to death all these sinful things. And Paul uses this word, put to death, it's an extreme phrase, it's a forceful phrase. He says, kill it, kill it. Don't entertain it, don't flirt with it, don't negotiate with it. Don't ignore it. Don't try and cohabit or coexist with sin. Don't just hate it. Put it to death. He says sin is not something that you play around with, that you mess around with. Do something powerful with it. And you might be asking, well, why is sin such a problem? Surely it's outdated. Why is God so old-fashioned? Surely God could just update the Ten Commandments. I mean, we're, we're living in the 21st century and we're far more advanced and modern than the Israelites and when the Bible was written a few thousand years ago. Why do we have to worry about sin? Why is sin a problem? Well, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, 
sin breaks our intimacy and our closeness with God. Just like when someone upsets you or wrongs you, that relationship is strained. It's under pressure. It becomes difficult. It's awkward to deal with them if there's been an issue. The same way, our closeness with God um, is affected. Our sin separates us from God. When we sin, we don't lose our relationship with God. He's still our Father. He always will be if you've put your faith in Jesus. But it does affect our fellowship, 1 John chapter 1 says. So the closeness, the sweetness, the communion that we have with God, that is broken when we sin. It also causes feelings of guilt and shame and condemnation, which can last for, for weeks or months, sometimes years after we've sinned. Another problem with sin is that it causes destruction in our own life. If God has a perfect pattern of how we should live, one of righteousness that brings blessing and peace and hope and joy and life and, and wholeness, then when we sin, we get off this perfect path that God has for us. And repeated sin in the same area causes long-term harm and long-term destruction in our life. Another problem with sin is that it hurts others. And as much as we use the statement, well, the sin that I'm doing, it's not affecting anyone else. That's just an excuse or, or a justification to sin. But actually, sin has a much bigger impact than just me and my life. And a fourth problem with sin is that it stops us experiencing the kingdom of God. It stops us experiencing the activity of God in our own life. None of us is perfect. I think we know that. But there's a very big difference between someone who is um, repentant of their sin, wanting to change, and pursuing Jesus, and ultimately sinning less and less. A big difference between someone like that and someone who is unrepentant, who's choosing and enjoying to live in their sin. Big difference, friends. God cannot bless sin. And that's why it's such a big deal. And that's why Paul says these extreme words. He says emphatically, put it to death. Don't mess around with it. Don't flirt with it. Don't negotiate with sin. Do something drastic with it. And Paul lists 11 different sins that we should be waging war against and fighting against in our faith. Sexual immorality impurity. Now God has given us a sexual appetite and sexual desires and those are good and he's made them to be enjoyed within the context and the boundary and the protection of marriage. It's not God being old-fashioned, it's his pattern for a healthy marriage that goes on for years and years and decades. God intended that the passion and the romance, the fire if you like, in our relationships should be contained and protected within a fireplace. Otherwise, if we do it wrong, it gets out of control, we'll burn the whole house down. God's pattern to keep it safe because it is such a powerful force. Third one he lists, passion. When we become a slave to our passions or our lusts, evil desires, the desire to do wrong things, Covetousness, number five, the desire for things of the world and in general, the desire to have more and accumulate and be selfish. Then he lists three passions of the heart. Anger, which is a long lasting, kind of a slow burning anger. Wrath, which is a quick, immediate, sudden anger. Malice, which is a viciousness. Then he lists three more passions of the heart, which come through our lips. Slander. Speaking badly about someone. Obscene talk or filthy language or, or crude jokes. And then lying. How do we put these things to death? A couple of principles. It needs to be consciously. We can't just arrive at church on a Sunday or, or tune into to YouTube on a Sunday and have our life group Zoom meeting and expect those things to just magically disappear. We have to consciously set our mind to tackling them and fighting them. 
They need to be done actively. There's no ways that I can live and expect that passively these things are going to be sorted out. It's got to be active. It's got to be decisively. We've got to choose and be purposeful and intentional about tackling and putting to death each one of these things. It's got to be radically. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. He wasn't meaning physically mar your body, but he says deal with sin in a radical way that it never comes back. Put things in place that will change how you're living. And I think prayerfully as well, because we can change our behavior, but we need God to change our mind, our thinking. And if God can change our desires, our passions, what we want deep down inside, that's going to help a whole lot for sorting out the actual outward acts and behavior. Prayerfully, so consciously, actively, decisively, radically, and prayerfully. Another way we can put these things to death is with accountability. While we're walking a road with someone who's more mature than us, who can help us and be a buddy alongside us, that's another way that we can walk these things out. And then if some of them are serious, like addictions, then we need to get counseling, we need to get professional help or possibly medication to deal with these things. Obviously, God can and does deal with some things immediately and supernaturally, but sometimes we need the help that God's given medical experts, etc. So Paul says, put to death these things. We cannot follow Christ without putting things to death. But following Jesus is not only about putting things to death. Killing sin is not the only point. And killing sin in itself doesn't bring us joy and life and wholeness. What we put on as Paul says, is more important than what we put off, what we kill. The new you, the new, new me, is not only, decide, not only um, defined by what we put off, by the sins that we kill and that we get rid of. It's also defined by the evidence of Christ living in my life and expressing the goodness of God out through me. As Christians, we're not defined, we shouldn't be defined by what we say no to, but by whom we finally say yes. People will notice when we, are, when we stop being sexually immoral. They might even ask us about it. But Paul says, if I give away all that I have, if I surrender my body to the flames, 1 Corinthians, but I don't have love, something that's positive and outward, I can have the strictest life of not sinning, but if I don't have love, then it's of no value to me, Paul says. And he says also in John chapter 13, by this all will know that you're my disciples if you, if you have love. And so it's not only about what we stop doing, but it's also about what we put on, the new me, the new you, which is one created in love after the image of God. Because you and I, we can avoid pornography entirely. We can avoid boiling with anger. We can never cheat on our taxes. But that doesn't make us right with God. We could still hate Jesus. By the same token, no one can experience the compassion, the humility, the love, the new self, unless they're born of God. Those things only come from a relationship with Jesus. And so if you and I hear this heavenly call to put off the old self and to, to, to mortify the flesh and to kill some sin that, that's still in our life, if, if God is challenging you and putting your finger on that thing, we shouldn't be upset or grumpy about these things that we have to put off. Actually, we should focus on the fact that God is renewing us. He's making us new. He's making us different. And that's really important. Christian maturity is not only marked by the sins that we put to death, but by a deeper personal knowledge and transformation and intimacy with God. We've missed the point if we're upset about the old stuff we have to give up. Actually, God says there's something new that I'm wanting to do in you. 
And what I said to my seven-year-old when he came face to face with his sin is that only God can help him deal with this thing in the long run. And that he needed God's spirit to get inside him and to enable him. And so I, I prayed for, for Ethan to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit that helps us destroy things, the bad things in our life, and the spirit that helps us put on the new things that God's wanting to make us like. And Paul speaks about those new things that we have to put on. He says, put on compassion, this love for others who are hurting, who are broken. Jesus had compassion. Kindness, which is the response to the compassion in our hearts and, and us doing stuff for people in need. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And we need a whole lot of this compassion-fueled kindness right now with COVID-19 and this pandemic and us being in lockdown and many people not working. We need to find ways where we can be kind to people, where we can help people. They can be really small, simple ways. For an example, this week we helped someone who didn't have a printer. They couldn't print out a whole lot of schoolwork for their kids at school. They were batting to get through all the work. And so we printed out over 100 pages and dropped it off at their doorstep. And they're able now to continue with their schoolwork. That's something really simple and didn't cost very much. But you could make some meal or meal for someone or buy groceries for someone. We need to look for ways to give. Someone in our housing estate is collecting donations and working with the ward counselor to make up food packs and get the food out to those who are really hungry. Sam and Ronnie in our church are doing the same with their ward counselor in their, in their area. I encourage you, get hold of them. As a church, we've helped over 10 families with all kinds of different needs at this time. Sometimes it's groceries and food. Sometimes it's, it's electricity or, or airtime or data or whatever it is. I encourage you, allow God to stir you to be kind, to give in all kinds of ways that He prompts in your heart. Third one Paul mentions that we should put on is humility. And this is living in a way where we are uh, conscious about the fact that God is God and I'm just human. That God is sovereign and King and Lord and I'm just one of His creatures. Living in that place of, of um, humility, knowing our true station in life. And knowing that we are His representatives, we're His ambassadors, we carry His authority and His power to effect change all around us. That's humility. Knowing where it comes from. Meekness. Meekness is not being a, a doormat and letting people walk all over you. Meekness is choosing to curb our anger and um, control our response when we are wronged, when people provoke us, etc. When someone's mean to us. Patience, which we know all about. Which is easier now because we're not driving so much and we don't have taxis and other cars cutting us off. So our patience is really getting good right now. Number six, Paul says... Bearing with one another. We all have stuff that other people have to put up with. And we need to extend the same grace to other people when there is their stuff that we have to put up with. And I'm sure that all of us, having been in lockdown the last five and a bit weeks, we're all experts by now of bearing with one another. We could give online classes to people to help them because we've been doing so much of it the last five weeks. Number seven, forgiving one another just as the Lord forgave us. And what that means, friends, is where we consider the forgiveness that I and you have received from God for our many, many, many sins. God has forgiven us completely without any requirement of paying anything back. We should be able to forgive others their few sins by comparison. Forgiveness. We've got to put on forgiveness. How do we do that? <laughs> well, it's not easy. It takes practice. We mustn't give up at the first attempt. But we put on these things through our relationship with Jesus. And in some of the other verses, Paul lists some kind of principles of how we put them on through our relationship. Verse 14 Love, which binds all of them together. 
Now the Holy Spirit pours the love of God into our hearts. And so we need the Holy Spirit to be working love in us. There's no ways we can ever change without the power of God's Spirit at work inside us. So if God is prompting you in an act of love or compassion or forgiveness, then respond in obedience to Him. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule. Let peace be your decision maker when you're interacting with people. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In other words, get deep in God's word. Personally, each one of us individually, learn from God. Let his word dwell in us. Meditate on it richly. It's part of why we're doing these Monday night moments. We're wanting to get a little bit deeper into the Word of God and let it work itself out through us as we put on these things. So join us Monday night if you can. Also in verse 16, teaching and admonishing, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, worshiping God. Verse 17, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you're about to do something that you're not sure about, or that makes you feel a bit uncomfortable, or you're about to, to uh, share some juicy gossip that you probably know you shouldn't do, but you're tempted to do it, ask yourself, if Jesus was doing this thing with me, if I was asking Jesus' help to do this thing with me, would I still do it? If Jesus was listening into my conversation, would I still say these things? It's a good a filter for us to, to use for our behavior, for our actions, and for our words as well. My son wanted to give up. He wanted to quit because he, he's a bit of a perfectionist and he doesn't like getting things wrong, especially not the first time. Uh, but he wanted to give up and quit when he couldn't keep getting these things right. And friends, we often face the temptation to give up. We resign ourselves to an incomplete conquest of sin, to an incomplete putting on of new things or renewing our mind because it's too hard or we failed the first few times or because we're not as good as someone else who seems to be further along the journey than we are. Or we got tempted in an area and we sinned and we failed and we just like, oh, can't seem to get this right. We get frustrated with ourselves despite our best efforts. And I told my boy, that his mom and his dad are never, ever giving up on him. And that God is never, ever giving up on him. So he mustn't give up on himself. And friends, God has not given up on you or me. You might have been rejected. You might have been written off by the world, by friends, by family, even by the church. I want to say, friends, God has not given up on you. And we can come to God's throne, Hebrews says, in a time of need to receive mercy and find grace to help us. So let's fight this good fight of the faith. Let's put to death radically the stuff, the sins that are entangling us, that are stopping us from running the race that God has marked out from living with righteousness and, and receiving the full measure of the blessing of God in this life. Let's keep putting to death those things, friends. And let's ask God's Spirit and each other help to put on this new self, these new things that God is doing. Let's keep renewing our mind in Jesus' name. Father, thank you that you love us so much that you refuse to leave us alone. You ask us and you empower us by your Spirit to put to death all these different things. And I pray, Lord, that we would have a, a hatred towards sin in our lives. Just in the same way that you hated sin so much, you sent Jesus to die. You dealt with sin radically. Father, would you give us the same ability and mindset to deal with sin radically in our lives, to put it to death. To bury it, not even to put a gravestone there. We don't want to remember it. Father, Father, let's bury this stuff. But Father, I ask for your spirit, for your enabling, for your grace to put on the new things which are being renewed in the image of God. Thank you 
Lord, that you're changing us. Would we respond to you with faith and with obedience as you do this stuff in our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Hope to see you tomorrow night. Um, if it's Sunday while you're watching this, a Monday night moment. Join us for Life Group on Tuesday and Wednesday, for our prayer meeting on Thursday at 7.30 on Facebook, and our youth are meeting. We have started a youth group in lockdown. How amazing is God? So if you have teenage kids or you know friends with teenage kids and they are just doing nothing on Friday night, get hold of us. We'll connect them and we'd love to see them join what God is doing in our young people. Have a great week, everybody. Amen. We're going to end off with one more song. And it's a really good song. Listen to the words carefully. Allow God to stir your heart and respond to Him in line with what we've spoken about this morning. Allow worship and the power of God and the Spirit of God just to start working deep inside your heart. Let's respond to God with this next song. Cheers, guys. So this song was a song that I started, I wrote the lyrics for and had some of the melody for about four or five years ago. And I came across it in the last week or so and really just got, yeah, arrested by the words and the lyrics that I'd written and I felt that this was a song for now that these words were for us that this cry was for us as the church so I want to sing it for you now and I pray that it rings a, a chord in your heart and um, a, you join me with a cry of my heart here to for God to consume us with his presence and with his fire to ignite us Share.